By several metrics, Indigenous Australians fare worse than non-Indigenous people in police custody and prison. And this is despite finally being classified as people for the census by referendum in 1967. It was the most successful referendum in Australian history, with overwhelming support in every state. Because believe it or not, once upon a time, accepted wisdom was that Aboriginal people would actually die off like the Tasmanian tiger because so few gave two shits about them or their culture or their future. That was a long time ago in an era of Jim Crow in America and apartheid in South Africa. The world was a brutal, bigoted place. So he's hoping our attitudes have progressed at least a little bit. The Guardian recently claimed that there'd been a higher number of deaths among white people in custody than black people, at least since 2002. Now this is obviously a total figure because Aboriginal Australians represent just over 2% of the population, but account for more than a quarter of the prison population. So even a lower percentage of deaths per prisoner still equates to a greater likelihood per capita of dying in prison than if you are not Aboriginal. In Victoria, at least, the disparity between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people is the lowest of any state in the country, although still pretty high, with 1% of the population representing 8% of those in jail. Now, I'm going to use the nouveau terms black and white to simplify this discussion, although we all know that race is pretty obviously not binary. 25 years ago, we held a royal commission into the treatment of black Australians by law enforcement after a 16-year-old kid called John Peter Pat died before he even got to the police station. A bunch of drunk cops in Western Australia basically started a fight with a group of black Aussies at a pub, arrested them and then beat the ever-living shit out of them one by one back at the cop shop. At some point, Pat was knocked backwards onto the pavement and by the time anyone even bothered to check if he was still breathing, he wasn't. He died without ever being charged it's the sort of thing for which everyone today would scream demands for unequivocal justice. But sadly, Pat never got it. The cops got off manslaughter charges by pleading self-defense. The jury in the trial was all white. The police officers responsible refused to give evidence at a coronial inquest into Pat's death. And the police union got the government to pay for all their legal costs, while at the same time trying to get rid of the Aboriginal legal service which provides the many black Aussies who encounter the justice system in WA with a lawyer and an actual chance to defend themselves. You've got to love the audacity of public sector unions when it comes to protecting the worst of the worst. Now, any death caused by the state itself, represented here by WA police, is a miscarriage of justice of the highest possible order, especially so in a country that's outlawed the death penalty. But the death of David Dungay in 2015, for which the current crop of Black Lives Matter protesters are taking to the streets, is different. Yes, we are still in a place 25 years later where black people are overrepresented in the prison population. But today at least, black prisoners are less likely to die in jail or be killed than white prisoners. Knowing that, the next logical step is to look at the incident itself. It looked to prison staff like Dungay was attempting suicide, trying to set off a hyperglycemic reaction by eating a whole pack of Tim Tams he carried with him to maintain blood sugar as a diabetic. And this is the saddest part of the whole story. When they realised what he was doing, the guards made a decision, right or wrong, to move him to a cell with video monitoring so he could be watched and so they could intervene if he tried to do it again. The guards asked him to put his hands through the hole in the cell door so they could cuff him for the move. They warned him that force would be used if he failed to comply. He refused and then demanded they come and get him. When they opened the door, he charged at them, then proceeded to ceaselessly flail about while four and later five guards used overwhelming force to try and restrain him. He resisted them at every turn, which could easily be an involuntary fight or flight response, but remember we're talking about a violent rapist who'd been convicted of armed robbery and the aggravated sexual assault of his girlfriend, and who from all accounts was an extremely uncooperative inmate, physically assaulting staff on at least two occasions. In adding years to his sentence, the judge in Dungay's case claimed his decision was, quote, 
much influenced by the violence which Mr. Dungay's offences exhibited. No society, black or white, can tolerate such conduct. There is no excuse for the intrusion of four thugs into the house of his victims. None for the threats to kick him, kick him. None for the striking of one victim around the head with a weapon similar to a metal bar or pipe. None for threatening and striking with a knife. And none for menacing a 90-year-old woman also in the house. It was while he was still on parole in respect of the August 2006 offences that he committed the attempted sexual assault. No woman should be subjected to the attempted rape of which the jury found Mr. Dungay guilty." Unquote. Eventually they did manage to pin him down, but at that point it took five of them to hold him still while a nurse sedated him. The officers never stopped communicating with him and repeatedly asked him to stop resisting. Although they thought they were keeping an eye on his breathing, as you can hear quite clearly in the video, there's a pretty good argument they didn't do enough on that front. Particularly after 10 milligrams of the benzodiazepine midazolam was administered to a man whose blood vessels and airways were fighting the combined force of five burly prison guards. Notwithstanding his mental health issues and the substandard way we deal with that in this country, nothing about this incident screams racist white cops gunning for a fight with blacks, as might have been the case in decades past. Unfortunately, the combination of midazolam, pre-existing illness, hyperglycemia, and the prone restraint used by the guards killed him over the course of the next hour. The coroner couldn't establish a single cause of death. The guards didn't beat the shit out of him until he couldn't move. They didn't even have him in a chokehold, and short of setting him loose or just leaving him to fall into a diabetic coma, I'm at a loss to understand how those guards could have dealt with this issue differently without putting staff at risk. And so was the coroner. The only person a four-year inquest identified as having really stuffed up was the nurse, who refused to go back into Dungay's cell after administering chemical restraint out of fear for their own safety. Apart from that, we might never have any more culpability on Dungay's death, and whether he really was attempting to trigger some sort of incident, or just enjoying the only remaining pleasure in his life, a chocolate biscuit. I want to support the cause, guys, I really, really do, for the sake of race relations and the future of our great nation. But when this is what you put forward as your reason for blatantly ignoring a ban on mass gatherings in the middle of a pandemic, with community transmission of the coronavirus out of control in Victoria and on the precipice in New South Wales, and with the whole country pleading with you to not protest, you're making it all but impossible. As far as we know, nobody caught the virus from the six COVID positive individuals at the Melbourne rallies, but that doesn't mean mass gatherings are suddenly safe to go ahead. If you really want to bring white Australia on board with changes to our limp dick legalese constitution, if you really want to educate people about this stuff, it has to be a conversation, not a list of demands in a hostage situation, especially when that hostage is public health. I wish there were easy solutions to the myriad problems faced by Aboriginal Australians, but we've been trying to rectify these disparities in outcome for the better part of a century, with billions upon billions of dollars spent for such marginal improvements. So it's hard to hold out hope for a better future. It's more than enough to make you want to take to the streets, I know. And until now, there's at least been hope in the fact that black and white Australians still talk to each other. But pushing ahead with protests on the streets of Sydney, despite coronavirus restrictions being reinforced by the courts and being asked not to by just about everyone else, and with the protest organiser, who was one of just a few people arrested today, incapable of even wearing a mask properly, the real message seems to be that black activist lives matter and no one else's. I can't think of a better way to get Australians of every colour and creed offside than by saying, quite literally, state of emergency laws in this horrible pandemic apply to everybody else but me. Please, for the sake of black and white and everything in between, it's time to stop this madness.